I had to sit down just to make this video because you're gonna want to sit down before you hear this news. I bought a Mac. After years of my friends trying to convince me to switch from Windows to Mac OS, I finally did it. Because there's one thing that, that Mac OS does that my Windows laptop doesn't and I need it. What's up guys, I'm Aaron the Tech Guy and it's time to find out why I bought a Mac. Here's, make no mistake, I'm not getting rid of, uh, of my Yoga C940. It's still, after, after six months-ish, it's still working great and it does most of the things that I wanted to do. Here's the thing, I have an iPhone. I also like to take pictures. And I, also, I have a DSLR that I use for most of my shooting. But here's the thing, I don't always have my DSLR. It's not always with me. So at, as a backup, I use my phone to take pictures, but go, let's go back to it. I have an iPhone. Apple makes all their stuff to be as simple as possible. So the camera app is just a viewfinder and a shutter button, but I want to be able to have manual settings and I want to be able to shoot raw. So I have an app called Obscure that allows me to do both of those things. Here's the thing. The UI isn't very intuitive, so, and it's slow and it crashes a lot on my phone. So I wanted to learn Swift and make a better version. But I don't have a MacBook and you can't use Swift on Windows machines. So I went on eBay and I picked up a MacBook Pro from 2015. So in this video, I'm gonna go over my first impressions when I, when I get, get the laptop and I'm gonna go over some tips on how to shop on eBay and not get scammed. But first, I think it's time for me to stand up because this is a very uncomfortable position to sit in. Okay, so now that I'm standing up again, let's discuss how I knew that I wasn't gonna get scammed on eBay. Because eBay is a big place, right? And if you haven't been living under a rock, you know that eBay is the place for scammers to go. Here's the thing. Stereotypes aren't always true. The, the first big thing I wanna talk about is eBay's money back guarantee. A lot of sellers will say that they don't accept returns. Here's, here's the thing. We fi I found a blog post while I, while I was researching that said the reason this is is because the sellers don't want them back if a buyer ex is experiencing buyer's remorse. Like if I buy a MacBook, a site I hate it, and I want to return it. The seller doesn't want it back. I, that, that's on me. But if you get scammed, eBay has their money back guarantee. So you can file a claim and th they will reimburse you if the item was totally smashed or it just didn't arrive. So right from the start, I knew I had that going for me. Second, I looked very carefully at the listings. A lot of listings just have either stock images or like one image or it's too cheap to be true. I actually ended up settling for a slightly more expensive laptop, but it had a lot of personal images and the seller was reviewed really, really well. So it was pretty clear that it was just some guy selling his laptop. And I ended up being right. I reached out to the seller with a couple questions and he's been extremely responsive. So that's how I know it didn't get scammed. So what you wanna look for is either a big reseller with, with well laid out like, descriptions and cards or it's some guy selling his laptop and just wants to get rid of it. So in my case, the seller does not accept returns, but this is because he just wants to get it off his hands. But the MacBook is in flawless condition. I don't have it yet but um, from all the pictures he sent me and from all the, everything he said, he, he said he bought a new 2020 MacBook Pro and he just wanted to sell it. So he, he, gave, he gave a pretty fair price, although it was a little bit more expensive than the other laptop I found for $400 that had a major dent in the, in the chassis. Um, this one sold for $527 and it's in pretty much flawless condition. So that's how you know how not to get scammed on eBay. For more information on this, I highly suggest you check out Luke Miani on YouTube who is thing is buying MacBooks on eBay. He's hilarious and he's a great YouTuber. So I highly recommend you watch him. Okay, so I've had my MacBook now for a few days and here are my thoughts. I'm going to do a totally unfair comparison between this five-year-old MacBook and my latest generation Yoga C940. Let's start with the exterior stuff, which is where the MacBook really hides its age well. The build quality on both these computers is top notch, but I think the MacBook edges it out by just a little bit, having less chassis and screen flex and can be open with one hand, provided you have all four feet, which 
I don't. Now let's talk about the keyboard. This is a very subjective category, but in my very unprofessional opinion, the one of the Yoga c 40 is just a little bit better. It feels a little bit clickier versus the MacBook, which is a little bit mushier. I, those are weird words, but I think it gets the point across better. Some may like the MacBook, but this is just my personal preference. One thing the MacBook does a lot better than the, than the Yoga are the function keys. They, you know, they actually make sense and include things like media keys. I mean, there's innovation, huh? One thing that I hate about the MacBook keyboard is the fact that there is no delete key. Like, come on. Whose idea was this? While we're on the subject of interfacing, let's talk about the trackpad. To the surprise of absolutely no one, the one on the Mac is just better in pretty much always. The MacBook Pro early 2015 was the first MacBook to have Apple's new force touch trackpad technology. You've probably heard this before, but in case you've been living under a rock for the past five years, here's what it is. Instead of a real click when you press down on the trackpad, there's a haptic motor that vibrates to emulate a real click. This method has a few advantages. First, and most importantly, you can press evenly anywhere on the trackpad, something Mac users have taken for granted in the past five years. Secondly, and many people might not even know this exists, you can press harder on the trackpad to get extra functionality. My favorite of, the, of these extra functionalities is being able to force click on a link in Safari to preview it. Here, check it out. Now on to the display. Since a Mac it is a Mac and that is that, hey it rhymes, look at that. The MacBook does not have a touchscreen. Despite that, this display is still fantastic. It is Apple's Retina display, meaning that the pixels are indistinguishable to the naked eye. Although it does not get much brighter than the Yoga C940, the anti-reflective coating on the display is much better at reducing glare, allowing for much better visibility outside. Inside, however, the two displays are almost identical. I don't actually know the color accuracy of both these computers, but just from looking at them, both these displays are fantastic. The Yoga gets back some of its point loss in outside usability, in versatility, aesthetics, in and size. Since the Yoga, as its name suggests, does yoga, it has pen compatibility, which I use very often to do math, markup documents, and other stuff like that. Due to the size of the chonky bezels on the Mac, when you look at them together, the Yoga just looks straight from the future. The Yoga is also 14 inches diagonally compared to the 13.3 inches on the Mac, which surprisingly does make a difference. IO is pretty decent on both. The MacBook has two Thunderbolt 2 ports, two USB A ports, MagSafe and SD card reader, and an HDMI port. While the Yoga has two Thunderbolt 3 ports and one USB A port. Overall, surprisingly to a lot of people, I actually prefer the ports on the Yoga on the Yoga, because USB C and Thunderbolt 3 allows a lot more functionality than Thunderbolt 2, which nowadays is pretty much useless. On the Mac, HDMI is nice. But not particularly necessary anymore considering many people are switching over to USB-C for like everything. A weird thing about the HDMI port is that it doesn't support my v my analog output so I cannot use it as for my VGA monitor so I'd have to use an adapter no matter what. The SD card reader is something I, I wish every computer still included as there have been no new storage mediums to replace SD cards as of yet so why are they just removing functionality that cannot be removed yet. MagSafe is also cool but it is so so expensive if you ever have to replace the charger. Now for something where the MacBook just stands no chance. The speakers. Simply put, they suck. Maybe I'm spoiled, but I legitimately found it painful to listen to these speakers for too long. To their credit, they do have good stereo separation, and they do get quite loud, but bass? It just doesn't exist. Don't just take my word for it. Listen to this comparison. At least as a, as a consolation prize, we get this. I believe that about sums up the exterior parts of this comparison. So now let's go into the into the internals, where things get a little bit less fair than on at the outside. As I mentioned earlier, I have the base model with the fifth generation Core i5, eight gigabytes of RAM, and 128 gigabytes of storage. For basic web, web browsing and stuff like that, this does just fine and you won't notice much of a difference between this and something newer. But once you get into things that are more intense, performance is, um, how do I put it? Bad. So 
since I'm a video editor, my intense task of choice is Adobe Premiere. While scrubbing through and editing, the MacBook played back very smoothly. Oh wait, that's at uh, one fourth resolution of 1080p. At full resolution, the Yoga still played back smoothly and the MacBook, well, it, it, it didn't. Let, let's keep it at that. Let's see if export times help out the Mac at all. Well, that's weird. Let, let, let's try it again. Hmm. Okay, the Windows laptop exported it in 11 minutes both times, and the Mac gets DNF. I spent a ton of time troubleshooting, and realized that if I export an H.265 instead of H.264, it exports the video in about 30 minutes much slower than yoga. I think it's sufficient to say, don't buy this strictly for video editing. It's doable, but not ideal at all. Battery life isn't really a fair comparison, because this Mac has over 700 cycles, so I'll just mention that it's nothing bad, getting me about 5 hours or so, but nothing fantastic either. I'll only mention my macOS experience shortly because the script is already getting too long, and I'm going to make another video on it, because there's a lot to talk about here. In short, macOS does Mac things. The integration with my phone is, was kind of cool at times, but there was nothing like mind blowing. And there's some things that just really pissed me off as I'll discuss in my dedicated video for that. So all in all, should you buy a MacBook Pro 2015? Maybe. Here's the thing. If you have seen any video about budget phones from someone like MKBHD, you'll know that he talks about trade-offs that you get at a lower price point. I'm gonna imply that same concept here. Instead of evaluating this as a $1,300 laptop, which is how much this cost in 2015, I'm going to evaluate it as a $500 to $700 laptop, which is about how much it costs nowadays. So let's look at some of the, those laptops. According to Windows Central, the best laptop for under $600 is the Microsoft Surface Go. Presumably the Surface Go 2 as well, but this article was released before the Surface Go 2, so it didn't really exist yet. Now the Surface Go 2, is a 2 in 1, so if you need to ink, it wins, but it's smaller and less powerful than the MacBook. Another laptop from this list was the, was the Lenovo, I can't pronounce Lenovo, Lenovo, Lenovo. The Lenovo IdeaPad Flex 14. It has a lot more power and it's a 2 in 1, the battery life is kind of bad and the screen is lackluster. Another one was the Acer Aspire E15, which has a ton of power, great battery life, great ports, but an average display, and is very bulky. Let's now add the MacBook into the mix. It has a great build, keyboards, ports, trackpad portability, and display. It has average battery life, kind of eh performance, and not a lot of storage, although it is, it is upgradable. Compared with all those options, the MacBook seems like a pretty decent combination of trade-offs. And I would say yes, it is well worth your money if it fits what you need it for. Productivity, and yeah, maybe coding, you know. Congratulations. You've made it to the end of this video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications with the bell icon so you don't miss any of our future videos. As always, you're watching A.E. Run, the tech guy.